Lovers, welcome to the Liberty Mike Podcast, broadcasting from an undisclosed location in the heart of Dixon. I am Michael, and I am here alone tonight. No, Drunk Larry, as one of our new listeners calls him. Um, yeah, he's on vacation. Uh, maybe drinking, I'm not sure. But um, I wanted to get some content out to you, and there's a few things that I want to discuss. Um, one is that I did get a message from, uh, someone asking about why all the Fauci hate, and I don't want to, um, go into it in any great detail here, um, before I talk to, uh, Natasha about it in person, but, uh, I imagine if, if there's interest, then we can cover a lot of this, but let's start here. Um, if you have questions about I don't know, uh, public health officials um, generally and how a lot of this industry works. I recommend that everybody go out and um, look up the article Sins of Omission. This is an old article from late 80s, maybe. Um, but I, I think that I, I recently reread it, and um, I think that you might find a lot of parallels with what's going on here. And, of course, uh, Fauci was involved in in all of that stuff as well because he's been doing this job for almost 40 years. So, uh, anyway, um, certainly worth the read, and it may give you some idea of why there are a bunch of people that don't care for him too much. And it might give you a different perspective on um, on public health officials generally. The the thing that people, I think, often forget about government officials is that just because they're government officials doesn't mean that they no longer have self-interest and, um, and internal bias and so forth. The, the truth is that government officials aren't working for the best thing for you. They're working for the best thing for them, just like everybody else out there. And um, there's no sense in romanticizing or glorifying these people because they're just people and um and they do the things that people do which is um act to benefit themselves or um you know just the general the the general truth that um that expectation uh influences perception and so um, their biases are embedded in their decisions just like everybody else. So enough on that. We can come back to that later if there's interest. Uh, I can go into a lot more detail about, uh, about Fauci specifically. Um, but, you know, the main thing in this one is that he just, he, he says everything. So whichever side you're on, you can pick out a bunch of statements that, um, that support your position um, because he's, you know, wear a mask, don't wear a mask. This works, this doesn't work. Um, he, he, he's a very effective bureaucrat uh, because he's had a lot of practice. So he knows how to cover his butt. Um, he knows how to, to speak a lot without really saying anything. Um, you know, he's, he's a politician like everybody else. And, uh, and that actually kind of brings us to the, to the first thing that I wanted to bring up, um, which is the story that's come out about the uh, Department of Justice spying on journalists, um, uncovering, or, you know, seeking to uncover emails and phone, uh, phone calls and so forth for uh, main, even mainstream journalists um, to try and uncover sources uh, when there are leaks. Now... This started under at the end of the of the Trump um, presidency and moved into well, it didn't actually like just start with the end of the Trump presidency. Like Obama's administration did some of this too, but um, this most recent event started at the end of the Trump presidency, like the last few weeks, as I understand it. I might have that wrong. At any rate. Um, it, it continued into the Biden presidency, even though he said in advance that he didn't approve of that kind of thing. And um, and it is finally, presumably, coming to an end. Um, 
And, you know, th- this came out of uh, Merrick Garland, um, who you may remember was uh, Obama's um, recommendation to the Supreme Court at the end of his presidency. Um, and he, you know, he was never confirmed because the Republicans refused to to see anybody. And that's why this leads in here, um, is that, the, of course, the Supreme Court has become a political body as well, although it was never intended to be. Although many of the founding fathers identified the Supreme Court as the most dangerous branch of the government um, and tried to limit their power as much as possible, it didn't work. Uh, obviously, they're um, in a position now where they redefine rights and um, and redefine the the contract that we all united under until you read Lysander Spooner and realize that we didn't agree to the Constitution at all. But the point being that it, it doesn't really mean anything anymore because um, we've given so much power to the courts to redefine the rules uh, as they see fit. And um, so, I, and I bring this up because uh, Merrick Garland, although now that all this has been exposed, including them um, filing gag orders to uh, prevent um, providers and editors uh, at the at the media organizations that were aware of the investigations by the DOJ, um, by the uh, you know attempts to to uh, suss out sources of of internal leaks. Um, they uh, there was a gag order filed against them to prevent them from revealing um, any of this as well, and and so now that's all kind of fallen apart. Um, but the reason I bring this up is that Merrick Garland is uh, is a man that has really no problem with huge government spying apparatus, and um, and so we should all be happy that he is not on the Supreme Court now. Of course, uh, you know Trump also got Kavanaugh on the Supreme Court, and that guy has no problem with um, using the the spy state either. Um, to spy on on citizens of the government, he's he's all in favor of the surveillance state as well. So, while it is certainly political, it's not as partisan as you might as you might think. Um, that, as usual, is a is a distraction. But um, anyway, I just wanted to bring that up. The main thing that I wanted to talk about, though, uh, and I'm going to keep this short because I don't set everything up like normal when. Um, when Gary's not here to record with me. And so I end up just like kind of doing a half-assed job of setting things up and I, I'm sitting on the floor and it's, uh, it's only comfortable for a little while. So I, it's part of the reason I try and keep these short. Also, all of these things are easier when it's a, when it's a conversation, um, a dialogue instead of a soliloquy. <laughs> uh, but Twitter um, recently uh, suspended or banned um, the president of Nigeria, uh, Muhammad Buhari, uh, for a comment that he made about the Nigerian civil war, or actually, I guess more accurately, um, a comment that he made about the young people that didn't understand what had happened back then and and how um, how he would address uh, them, which was. I don't know, maybe a little bit of a veiled threat, but either way, um, they, uh, the, you know, Twitter banned him for this comment. And I, I will actually just like right up front, um, this isn't entirely relevant, but I do want to point out that I would suspect that the president of Nigeria, regardless of his political agenda, uh, has a better understanding of what happened during the Nigerian Civil War than whoever at Twitter is reviewing these posts. Um, I, well, I don't want to be too rude about it, but, um, you know, if they're American, I'd be surprised if they could find Nigeria on a map. And uh, that's, you know, so their understanding of Nigerian history, I imagine, is is quite shallow. Um, So just to bring right from the front, like what, um, how can they, uh, say that 
uh, that anything that he says about this is is wrong. Um, I mean, where where's their standing on the matter? The the you know President Buhari was actually involved. Uh, he witnessed. He probably has um, a better understanding of it than than some um, random censor at Twitter, I would think. But uh, the interesting thing is kind of what happened afterwards, which was um, that he identified the uh, political agenda um, of Twitter in um, in banning him and uh, and blocked Twitter in Nigeria. Now, I don't approve of that either, um, certainly. So this is, this is just like a collection of mistakes, honestly. I, I don't think that Twitter should be censoring um, anybody, really, but, uh, you know, um, it seems in a realistic way that censoring heads of state is probably counterproductive for them. Um, and I don't agree with him blocking Twitter in his country, either because I think that the, you know, well, less government is better. But I, I think that this is kind of an interesting thing to talk about the aftermath um, because of all the, the lack of self-awareness, I guess, that, that surrounds this. So in response, Twitter put out a, um, a comment that said some, uh, Actually, I have the quote here. Let's see. It said, Access to the free and open internet is an essential human right in modern society. Now, I find that really, um, really interesting coming from Twitter considering their track record. Um, so if it's an essential human right, um, what about Donald Trump or Alex Jones or somebody on the left that they banned um, who I can't think of the name. Anyway... Uh, and then the, you know, the other part of this is that I have, we've talked about this before. We've got a, um, what I think is a really great episode about what, what our rights and what our rights are and what they aren't. Um, so this is, this is an example of a positive right. Now I'm a, I'm a huge advocate of negative rights and I am a huge opponent of positive rights. Um, Positive rights is something that requires action by somebody else. So free speech is a negative right. Um, it essentially requires inaction by somebody else. Uh, that uh, you are free to say what you please without being muzzled. Um, you, your right to life requires other people not to kill you. You know, these kind of things. Um, but you can exercise those rights on your own. Positive rights are, are rights that require action by somebody else. Like a right to health care um, requires uh, access to a doctor and their time and their um, expertise, et cetera, et cetera. So you, what you say when you're talking about a positive right is that you're, you're talking about a, a compulsion for somebody else to do something for you. And so... I don't agree with positive rights because I think it's tantamount to slavery, really. Um, so, but let's take this one as an example. Um, if, if access to the free and open internet is an essential human right, then if I'm walking down the street and I don't have access to the internet, can I compel someone to give me access to the internet? Like, can I take your phone? Because if you don't let me use your phone to access the internet, you are denying me an essential human right. Of course, once I take your phone, I'm denying you that right unless you have another device that you can access the internet with. But you see the, you see the problem here, right? Um, you know, if... It is interesting that I... that there are these groups of people that would agree um, that... Uh, without thinking things through that such things as access to the internet is an essential human right, um, but deny property rights. And so uh, there are probably some people out there that haven't really thought this through that when I give them that example, um, you know, it, it takes a moment for them to find a problem with it, I guess. Um, because you know, the phone, this just, 
is it really yours? The truth is, yes, it is. Obviously, it's yours. If I take your phone, then I'm stealing. Um, but the if, which right is more important? Um, the one that says that I shouldn't be able to take things from you or the one that says that you should give things to me. <laughs> um, and so that, that's the, the question here. I, I, I find it interesting that so many things have become rights without anybody having a real understanding of the long-term um, meaning of that. Because if the open, free and open internet is an essential human right, then I have the, the ability to compel somebody else to provide that to me, even if they don't want to, or... If it is a greater right than property rights, um, then I can make them give me their phone so that I can access the internet, so that I can have this essential human right. Um, and if they refuse, then they're denying me an essential human right. So I, I'm hoping that this is a... I've probably pushed this a little too far in terms of how long I've talked about that, but I hope that it's, it's clear to everybody um, what the problem with these kind of statements are. Uh, that healthcare is a human right, that uh, clean water is a human right. Um, all of these things require somebody else to give me something. And so I think anything that requires somebody else to, to do something for me isn't really a right. Um, now, in, <laughs> in response uh, to this also... Um, beyond the... And, and of course, the, the you know, duplicity of um, of Twitter, uh, who is at this point pretty well known for, um, banning people that they don't like, banning people for providing information that they disagree with, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. A year ago, if I had said that the, um, that the, uh, the Chinese lab, uh, was the source of the coronavirus on Twitter, um, that post probably would have been taken down. Um, of course that has changed now. Um, but then the, um, the diplomatic missions of the UK, the EU, the US, Canada, and Ireland, essentially the English speaking countries, except for, uh, for, um, Australia and, uh, the various African countries, including Nigeria, by the way, that speak English, um, said, uh, banning systems of expression is not the answer. These measures inhibit access to information and commerce. Now, I think that the, the important thing there is commerce. I think that that's their real concern, um, is, uh, the, you know, they certainly want, um, the uh, Western companies to have access to all of these resources and, uh, I don't know. It's a start, I guess, of, um, this president, um, taking control of his country in a way that, that while I don't agree with, um, and the, these governments don't agree with either, but they don't agree with them for different reasons, I guess. Um, because they want access to resources and I want people to be free. And that's the difference in the reasoning, even though the, the, um, the opposition is the same. And, uh, but the part that I find really interesting is that the Russian foreign ministry um, put out a statement that said that social media cannot dictate to a foreign state how to live and uh, how to interpret history, what movies to watch or music to listen to. Um, they said instead of freedom of speech, it becomes a dictatorship of opinion. And <laughs> what bothers me about this is that the, the Russian foreign ministry is saying the things that our government should be saying about this, it seems to me. That, um, and the, the long-term concern here is, and, and this is something that I've just started thinking about, um, because, you know, we uh, have a strong opposition to, um, to us, to central government generally. And I think that there's been a real push over the years to have, um, government pushed farther and farther away from individuals, um, and, of course, the ultimate goal would be the world government. And I see things like um, the pandemic fear, uh, global warming, etc., as vehicles to try and achieve that. Um, that you create a problem that can't be handled by local governments or local groups. Um, you create a problem that 
that you claim the only answer is to have some kind of coordinating body uh, over the entire world uh, to make sure that we do the right thing to get out of it. And um, it's hasn't been successful so far, but it's, I mean, I think that it's consistently moving in that direction. Um, and that scares me. I want decentralization. I want, um, I want government to be at the lowest level possible. I mean, obviously, um, the individual would be ideal, but people are going to bind into groups to achieve common goals. That's just, that's just part of, part of being social animals. And we have a responsibility, I think, in some ways to do that. Um, but I, I, I'm starting to think that maybe I've been looking in the wrong place. Like, that I've been concerned about things like the, the Paris Accords, um, the United Nations, and maybe what I should be looking at, maybe the real danger is these social media companies. Is what they're doing a, an attempt to try and um, act in a governmental way, I guess, to control information, um, to control narratives uh, worldwide, um, that they act in concert, uh, these various Silicon Valley's co Valley companies, um, acting in concert to control the way people think about issues, um, to control what people are interested in, uh, to, to control our minds in, in a, you know, um, I mean, that's like hyperbolic obviously, but, um, but not as hyperbolic as it seems like it should be. Um, uh, because if you can control the information in such a strict way, uh, if you can control people's access to information, that's actually like quite a lot of power. Um, and so I, I think that, uh, that they've proven that they can get away with an awful lot. Um, and of course, uh, you know, the, there's of course the argument out there that says, well, they're private companies, they can do as they please. Uh, well, um, there's something to that, but the truth is that these aren't, um, independent free market companies. This, the, these companies aren't the result of, of free enterprise and they're not working in a free market system. Um, if you'll think back to 2016, 2017, where a lot of this, a lot of the real censorship and social media started, it started as a result of government pressure about um, the elections uh, and the the Russian conspiracy and all of that. And I think it was made clear to these companies that if they didn't fall in line, um, and then the government has the power to shut them down, uh, as shown by Nigeria, actually, here. Um, but I, that seems to me that that was the place where this started. And there has certainly been, um, a lot of information out there that the, 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 these, some of these government agencies, intelligent agencies, um, law enforcement agencies are tightly entwined with these, um, these social media companies. And so they aren't, uh, they aren't truly independent, private, free market companies. They're heavily influenced by government. And then, of course, the government can always levy the threat of shutting them down or um, reducing the barriers to entry so that they have to deal with more competition. Um, and so this isn't really a free market system that's produced these groups. And as I said, um, if you have an issue with monopolies, then these groups also act in concert uh, with some regularity. You remember Alex Jones was kicked off of everything within about 24 hours, or almost everything. Um, so this was clearly planned and coordinated among these groups. Uh, I, I'm not, I just started thinking about this, so I'm not really sure where to go with it, but um, this is, it's something that I, I feel like I need to pay more attention to is what is the goal of these companies? They've shown that they can wield a lot of power, and they're, um, it seems to me that the leadership of these, uh, these groups is in agreement about 
um, wanting a more progressive, uh, bigger, more controlling government generally. And so now I'm starting to wonder if they're trying to be that. I don't know. Um, just a, as a side note, though, uh, you know, one of the things that changed about this, let me readjust myself because I'm getting uncomfortable, so this is about to be over. Um, one of the things that, that changed uh, about this is that um, prior to all this pressure by the government to censor um, things that they felt were um, inaccurate instead of totally inappropriate or illegal, um, the, the social media companies uh, functioned as publishers only, so they weren't responsible for the content that was pushed, like legally responsible for the content that was posted on their sites. Um, that's still true, but I think the idea that they are just a, a publisher um, and not an editor now has changed. And um, after the Nigerian um, move to to take Twitter off of its networks um, within the country, um, India threatened to withdraw publisher protections from Twitter as well. If Now, once again, this is one of those, if you don't do things the way... Uh, our government wants you to, um, then we're going to withdraw these publisher protections, and so therefore you would now be liable for uh, content posted on your site by users. Um, so there are <laughs> there are limitations to this. Uh, obviously, um, this could become a real struggle between these between governments and these uh, sites if they don't play along. But that's the danger. Like the the in the end, the government at least right now, um, governments of these nations uh, have the power to um, to severely limit, if not completely end, um, social media activities. And so the tendency is going to be for, uh, for the social media companies probably to um, succumb to these threats and uh, play ball with the governments further. And then they just become another tool of government um, to oppress all of us. So uh, there you go. There's a happy note to end on. Um, and uh, yeah, I think that we'll we'll stop there. And let me know. Of course, you can always contact me at michael at the liberty dot com. Um, let me know if you're interested in me going into uh, greater detail about Fauci's history and um, why none of us should really trust this guy. Um, because I'm I'm happy to do so. And I suppose that's it. Uh, all right. Well, um, we should be back in a week with Liberty Larry as well. And uh, in the meantime, you know, follow us everywhere. Um, we're not on Twitter. <laughs> I don't think we would last very long, honestly. So that'll that's not likely to happen. We've already had issues with YouTube. So, but you can still find us there so far. Uh, YouTube, Facebook, um, iTunes and Podbean, you can subscribe, um, like and share, uh, leave comments. As I said, you can email me, uh, and if you have topics you want me to discuss, you can email me, or if you come across an article that you find interesting, I can't read everything, um, you can email me also, and, uh, cause I'm, I'm happy to interact. And, um, I suppose that's it, so, uh, we'll be back in about a week. When we finally get this right, and in the meantime, try to stay free. Ciao.